Good morning, everyone. My name is Liz Wishnick. I'm a senior research scholar at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and also a senior research scientist at CNA on leave from my position as professor of political science from Montclair State University. Um, it's my great pleasure to moderate this event about Mongolia between two giants, Cold War lessons and today's realities. Mongolia has a long and fascinating history, uh, but its role in global affairs often is neglected, and I hope this panel will, will um, contribute to a better understanding of uh, Mongolia's um, unique and fascinating position in international affairs. And we're so lucky to have uh, three eminent speakers uh, to discuss this topic. One will be joining us uh, shortly, but our primary speaker is Ambassador Bhatbayar Sedandamba, who is principal researcher of the Institute of History and Ethnology in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and president of the Mongolian Association of International Studies. He had a long and illustrious uh, diplomatic career. He was ambassador to Cuba, uh, uh, director of the Department of Policy Planning in the Mongolian Foreign Minister, Ministry, and political counselor and deputy chief of mission in the Mongolian embassy in Beijing. So I, had, I had the pleasure to, to meet with him uh, periodically during my visits there. Um, he was also a visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies. He received his PhD in history from the Institute of Far Eastern Studies in Moscow and his BA from Leningrad State University. And he recently published a two volume work, unfortunately only in Mongolian at present, on Mongolia and the major powers, looking at Mongolian history from 1900 to 2000. So um, he will be speaking uh, about Mongolia's current international position, looking at Cold War history for context, and he will be expressing his personal views only, not the views of any government agency. Ambassador Bhatpayar, uh, we turn the floor over to you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Liz. Uh, dear colleagues, good morning. Uh, however, in Mongolia, it's <laughs> Uh, evening. Uh, uh, today, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Liz Vishnik uh, from Columbia University and uh, organizers uh, of this panel for the dedication and uh, kind efforts to make it. Uh, uh, this panel is a uh, 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 reality. Uh, today, I will discuss uh, uh, about Mongolia's uh, uh, Cold War lessons. Then, of course, I will talk about Mongolia's current uh, uh, position on uh, international issues, including uh, Ukraine, uh, crisis, and uh, especially how Mongolia is trying to uh, balance its relations with its two big neighbors, uh, namely Russia and China, and also uh, uh, Mongolia, uh, how is Mongolia doing its best to balance between uh, two big neighbors on one side, and its so-called third neighbor countries on the other side. Uh, let me begin. Uh, around uh, 60 years ago, in early 1960s, uh, Mongolia confronted its biggest dilemma in its uh, 20th century history to choose whose side or to ally which never. During the Cold War, faced with intense confrontation between two, its two giant neighbors, Russia and China, 
Mongolia had no other choice than to show full solidarity with Moscow and went into an alliance with the Soviet Union. Yungjagin Tsitambal, the leader of Mongolia at that time, first asked for a membership at Warsaw Treaty Organization. But when this proposal was rejected, he had to sign a mutual assistance treaty with Moscow in January uh, 66, 1966. Soviet forces uh, reached its peak of uh, 100,000, 120,000 men in 1979. Actually, even with uh, Deng Xiaoping's reform underway in China in 1970s and Leonid Brezhnev's death in Moscow in 1982, Mongolian leader Tsitimbal failed to understand the new developments around Mongolia, then called Mongolian People's Republic, and continued to maintain its uh, own Cold War with Beijing, People's Republic of China. This is a historical lesson which even today influences thinking of our policy makers and decision makers. Uh, first, uh, let me say a few words on Mongolia's gov Mongolian government's official position on the Ukraine crisis. Foreign Minister of Mongolia, Mrs. Batsitsek, has done se several interviews on the ongoing Ukraine crisis and expressed official, official position on that issue. If I summarize her views, it will be following. She was talking, the Foreign Minister was talking that the whole world is watching the situation in Ukraine with concern. Everyone is concerned about the real risk of civilian casualties, displacement from their homes and homelands, and the growing humanitarian crisis in Ukraine. Politicians and academics of the world express different positions and call on, its, call on the stakeholders to refrain from any steps and actions that will increase the tension and resolve the crisis through dialogue. Internationalizations and security experts have different predictions about how long this crisis will last. Some have concluded that the tension has escalated and it's likely to drag on for months. It's a process of establishing a new world order and distribution of the balance of power has just begun. There are predictions that this situation will last at least uh, four or five years. Many of these assumptions and analysis are reasonable, but in the uncertain conditions of today and tomorrow, both predictions can be easily refuted. So it, it's impossible to say that one is right or the other is wrong. Our country, Mongolia, values peace, conducts an open foreign policy, open multipolar foreign policy, and firmly stands on the position that any conflict should be resolved through peaceful dialogue. Escalation of tensions will seriously harm peace and stability, not only in Europe, but also in the world. Uh, as our foreign minister said, Mongolia has been consistent of declaring its nuclear weapon free status and is doing efforts to make Northeast Asia as a nuclear free zone. If countries pursue arms race for their own security, they risk undoing previous gains in nuclear non-proliferation. Therefore, the international community believes that it's important to work together to prevent the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine from getting out of control 
by making efforts to resolve situations through political and diplomatic methods. So in short, Mongolian government is for the dialogue and uh, for political and diplomatic methods to resolve the situation, crisis situation in U Ukraine. Uh, second, I would like to talk about the voting records by Mongolia at the United Nations since uh, February 24th of 2024. The voting records of, by Mongolia at the United Nations clearly illustrate the difficult efforts of Mongolia to stay neutral at the world body. In March 2nd, 2022, the 11th Emergency Special Session of the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted the resolution called Aggression Against Ukraine. 141 countries endorsed the resolution. Five countries voted against and 35 countries abstained. Mongolia was among the 35 countries abstained the United Nations. Another example, UN General Assembly adopted the resolution on the 12th October of 2022. This resolution demanded that Russia immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw from Ukraine as it is violating its territorial integrity and sovereignty. The resolution passed with an overwhelming vote of 143 in favor, five against, and 35 abstaining. Mongolia was among the 35 countries abstained. In overall, Mongolia abstained in all major voting procedures at the United Nations involving the Ukraine crisis during last year, 2022. Next, I would like to say a few words about our relations with two immediate neighbors and with our third neighbors, especially uh, last year. Uh, Mongolian President Hurusuk went to Samarkand in June 2022 to the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting to meet both Xi Jinping and Putin. By the fall of last year, he visited first Beijing, then visited Tokyo. Visits by Prime Minister of Mongolia, El Oyunger, then first to Vladivostok in September 2022, and then to Berlin, Germany in October the same year, reflects the desire by Mongolian authorities to keep as constant as possible working relations with both neighbors and their Western partners. Most recently, the president of Mongolia, Uhunagi Hurusu, paid a state visit to China uh, in the fall last year and decided to work with China to increase the, the bilateral trade volume to 20 billion US dollars in the next five years by stimulating cooperation in all sectors. Uh, they discussed a wide range of issues for future cooperation, such as increasing the export of mining products from Mongolia, diversifying the trade structure, and advancing the progress of bilateral development projects. As it concerns the northern neighbors, the Russian Federation, uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, uh, Mr. Lavrov, visited us, Ulaanbaatar, in the fall last year. He noted the successful development of relations between Mongolia and Russia, the level of a comprehensive strategic partnership, and both sides confirmed their, inter their interest in strengthening cooperation based on mutual trust. Its relations with two neighbors remain active. Relations with our third neighbors uh, should expand to the same extent. Last year, President 
Kurusuk paid state visit to Japan and Prime Minister Oyoir then visited Germany and Singapore. As for Japan, our president made a state visit after 12 years. The visit to Japan was important uh, because it celebrated 50 years of the establishment of diplomatic relations. In this context, a special strategic partnership for peace and prosperity between Mongolia and Japan was announced in Tokyo. A joint statement was issued in order to improve bilateral relations. The vision by Japan for a free and open Indo-Pacific region was endorsed by a Mongolian president. The Prime Minister of Mongolia also visited Germany and agreed in principle to raise bilateral relations to the level of strategic, strategic partnership. During the visit, it was agreed with Germany to start work on establishment of a copper processing plant in Mongolia and a semi-processing plant for rare earth elements, which are the main raw materials for electric cars. Also, the South Korean Foreign Minister Park Jin visited Mongolia last fall. It was decided to establish a joint research center for rare earth elements between Mongolia and South Korea. And its uh, work have, has already started. Let me say a few words about public opinion in Mongolia on Ukraine crisis. Mongolians basically have a common understanding that there is a real war going on between Russian Federation and Ukraine. Few Mongolians believe that it is a special operation of Russian military. But I must say that there are some people in Mongolia who stand on Russia's side and believe that Russia will win and Russia should not be defeated. There are senior people or 60 years old who miss socialism and Mongolian Soviet friendship. They are not a majority in Mongolian public, but they are free to express their position on social networks. Also, another factor is that some Mongolians believe that if Russia will be defeated, China will be too strong and can easily absorb Mongolia. They think that Russia is the only guarantee of Mongolia's national security. They express the opinion on social networks that Russia should not be defeated. Taking advantage of the Russia-Ukraine war, anti-American and anti-Western sentiments is also uh, growing in Mongolia. Some ordinary citizens believe that the main causes of this war are the United States and Western countries. And they think that it is uh, United States and Western countries they expanded the NATO into the Russian uh, near abroad. And it was the main cause of this uh, Russia-Ukraine war. However, most Mongolians believe that Russia should stop its aggression and aggression towards independent and sovereign Ukraine. That position is common. Also, Mongolians fear that if Russia will, when Russia is uh, uh, under enormous international economic embargo, and if this embargo will bring the Russian economy to standstill, uh, Mongolians fear that Russia will go into turmoil and Mongolian Russian relations will be seriously affected uh, by this Russian turmoil. Uh, let me say just a few words about. Uh, Ukraine crisis impact on Mongolian economy. According to statistics of uh, the last quarter of 
2021, released by uh, Bank of Mongolia, Russia accounts, accounts for only 4 5% of uh, international travel expenses of Mongolia. So it means that Russians uh, spend only 4 or 5% of all uh, expenses uh, foreign tourists spend in Mongolia. Uh, 19% of the total transactions made by Mongolian economy are transfers related to the Russian Federation. Foreign direct investment from Russia is very small, about uh, two, three million US dollars. Therefore, Mongolia is not a country that depends on natural gas from Russia, like most European countries. And Mongolia is not dependent on such products as flour, vegetable oil uh, from Russia and also Ukraine, like some African countries. Therefore, the impact of this war will affect Mongolia's economy mostly through changes in amount and price of fuel imports, because 21% of Mongolia's total imports are oil and gas products. Uh, Russia is an economy with a GDP of 1.4 trillion US dollars. Due to the war, the price of fuel imported from Russia to Mongolia can change. Uh, if the Mongolian fuel importing companies will pay their bills at higher costs, possibly in cash, it will increase the cost of fuel in Mongolia. Assuming that the fuel consumption of Mongolian enterprises and household remaining remain is at, at a constant level, the price increase will increase the costs of households and enterprises and can cause import dis disruption from the Russian Federation. Uh, in conclusion, uh, I would like to say that today Mongolia is again facing the old dilemma, old challenge, how to maintain the balance between its two giant neighbors, Russia and China. But unlike the Cold War period before 1990, Mongolia now already has developed extensive relations with the Western countries, so-called third neighbor countries, namely the United States, the European Union, India, Japan, and South Korea have an enormous stake in Mongolia's future as a democratic and prosperous country. We have a strategic partnership relations with five countries. Besides two immediate neighbors, Russia and China, we have strategic partnership relations with the United States, Japan, and India. And our relations with the EU and South Korea will be upgraded very soon. Therefore, in my personal opinion, Mongolian decision makers have to think before making any policy changes about Mongolian uh, foreign relations, whether they, whether they will seek short-term economic gains from Moscow or they should stay committed to liberal democracy and freedom. Uh, in my opinion, that our Mongolia's long-term commitment to liberal democracy and freedom is the uh, most important choice and is most uh, suitable for Mongolia's national interests. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Bakayar. Uh, uh, we appreciate your, your very illuminating comments, and we will come back to you with questions uh, very soon. Um, but first, I would like to thank uh, the audience for joining us. 
and uh, ask the audience uh, to prepare questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will get to your questions after the next two speakers. And I would also like to thank uh, Julie Kwan and the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, uh, the program on China and the world, and the Harriman Institute for hosting this event and sponsoring this event. So thank you. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Maris Rosabi, an historian of China and Inner Asia, who is an adjunct professor uh, at Columbia University, where he attracts uh, a great audience for his classes in Mongolian history. He's also a professor of history at Queens College in New York. He's the author, editor of 25 books um, on Mongolian history, on Chinese history, uh, Inner Asian history, and he has received many awards for his uh, long and illustrious career uh, studying Mongolia, including uh, from the Mongolian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So we're so pleased that uh, Dr. Rosabi could provide some comments on the China-Mongolia relationship. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with uh, Ambassador Batbayar, whom I've known for some years, and, uh, and enjoyed his uh, presentation. What uh, I want to start with uh, this issue of the third neighbor, and uh, I think it's wise to start with statistics. Um, turns out, uh, these are statistics for 2021, 83% of Mongolia's exports go to China. 38% uh, of its imports der are derived from China and 30% from Russia. Um, this is a staggering number and uh, obviously shapes the uh, position of, of Mongolia in terms of its foreign relations. Um, furthermore, 80% of Mongolian exports are in minerals, a copper, iron, gold, and uh, much of the rest is spread around uh, animals, uh, cashmere, and so on. So, uh, Mongolia is very heavily uh, indebted to China at this stage. Uh, uh, the, uh, I, I understand the uh, ambassador's point about a third neighbor, but uh, the relationship that really counts at the moment uh, is, with, is with China. And I know that the, um, uh, there has been throughout the ages, uh, considerable uh, tension between China and, and Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia was under the thumb of the Qing dynasty uh, from the 17th century up until 1911. Uh, and there have been, as the ambassador pointed out, there were tensions uh, in the 1960s uh, through the 1980s uh, between China and, and Mongolia as Mongolia lined up uh, with the Soviet Union uh, in its uh, uh, split with, uh, with China. So um, I, I understand fully that uh, the, the Mongolians want to not be totally dependent uh, upon China. But at this stage, uh, Mongolia uh, has to think about uh, its relationship with, with China and not so much uh, with, with Russia. Uh, I know that the, uh, the public opinion polls that are run by a very reputable uh, specialist, a man named Sumati, always ask the question, uh, which country ought Mongolia to work with and has Mon Mongolia's interests at heart? And it's always Russia as, at the very top. Uh, China is close to the bottom. But I think that will have to change at some point because China is, uh, despite the tensions and despite the fact that Mongolia uh, at various times has sided with Inner Mongolia and is concerned that the model of Inner Mongolia might uh, uh, present 
a, a real threat to to uh, Mongolia uh, is uh, it, it's something that has to be worked out, and uh, I, I think it can be worked out. There are more and more, for example, wh when I first uh, went to Mongolia after the uh, democratic, so-called democratic revolution in 1990, most Mongolians continued to go to Russia for, uh, for graduate studies, continued to go to Germany or Europe. Uh, now an increasing number are going to China, Japan, and Korea, and uh, Mongolia is beginning to fit in more with uh, Northeast Asia than uh, it, it has in the past. And there has been some investment as, uh, as but, uh, Ambassador Bhattabhaya pointed out from Korea, from uh, Singapore, but in fact, most of the economy is highly dependent still um, on China. And um, I, I would, uh, an anecdote on, on this score, I was briefing some of our State Department people a few, few months ago, um, and I pointed out that uh, the, uh, this conquest, as it's called, a kind of military training uh, that was uh, initiated by the United States, uh, really along the, the uh, Mongol-Chinese border, uh, that this irritated the Chinese. And uh, the response of some of these people were very interesting. The Americans said, uh, well, we should irritate China. Uh, I don't think that's the way to go about uh, dealing with China. And I don't think that's the way to, to go about uh, for Mongolia to deal with China. There are possibilities of working together with China on a number of issues. Um, the uh, issue of climate change, which has drastically affected the environment uh, in Mongolia, uh, is an area in which there could be co collaboration uh, with China. The, the uh, issue of Chinese mines in in Mongolia and try to uh, figure out ways of making them more uh, environmentally friendly so that they don't damage the, the uh, grasslands and and make it impossible for herders to, to uh, sustain themselves. Um, working with uh, uh, to an extent with the pollution, the tremendous pollution that uh, exists in the capital city, particularly in winter. It's a drastic and uh, disastrous environment in many ways in winter, having a, a tremendous effect on the health of the Mongolian population. So there are health issues that could be dealt with without talking about, uh, you know, political and other other aspects and not irritating the Chinese, which is uh, not uh, what I would consider a, a sound policy either from Mongolia or uh, the United States. Um, there is, of course, this uh, Belt and Road Initiative that uh, has been brooded about by the, by the Chinese, and one aspect of it is uh, a involvement in in building a pipeline. Uh, through Mongolia uh, to China. So the Chinese are uh, very interested in, in that and there appears to be some movement uh, in that regard. And it started in the 1990s, but not, not much was done. But recently there has been a greater and greater interest in, in developing, developing that. Uh, I wish there were, there were uh, many more alternatives for Mongolia. I, I think the third neighbor idea is, is splendid in theory, but in practice, I don't see uh, the, uh, a tremendous economic or political change being brought about by dependence on the third neighbor uh, approach. I wish uh, Mongolia was investing more and more of its mineral wealth into creating industries uh, that uh, that is not happening terribly much, partly because the, the Chinese Chinese products uh, have flooded in uh, to Mongolia uh, and have undercut any sort of uh, industries that infant industries that might develop. And finally, uh, uh, I think Mongolia has to deal with the problem of corruption. 
Uh, it's a very serious problem. Um, and there've been demonstrations as late as December uh, about money that seems to have disappeared from uh, mineral accounts, from mineral sold to China. Uh, uh, one of the presidents in the, in the period uh, from uh, around 2000, 2010, uh, was indicted for corruption. A prime minister uh, has been invited, uh, has been indicted. Uh, the money, uh, another scandal, money that was allocated for small and medium enterprises was uh, taken by uh, some of the ministers and used for their own enterprises or for their friends. So this has to stop. And um, I, I think uh, that will create better conditions for third neighbors to play a, 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 perhaps a, a greater role. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosavi, uh, for, for that uh, overview of, of the role of China in Mongolia's foreign policy. And now we turn to our third speaker, Dr. Sergei Radchenko, who is the Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He was previously also a visiting uh, fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and previous ta previously taught at Aberystwyth University in Wales, East China Normal University, among other illustrious places. And he is the author of uh, two books, um, Two Sons in the Heavens, The Sino-Soviet Struggle for Supremacy and Unwanted Visionaries, the Soviet Future in Soviet, Soviet Failure, rather, in Asia. And so now we turn to Dr. Radchenko for some comments on Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Wishnik, and thank you for thank you for inviting me. First of all, it's great to see Professor Rosabi and also Ambassador Badba. Uh, 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 we haven't seen each other for a long time, <laughs> but it, it, it's great to see you in this in this digital format. Um, I would I would just because I'm going last and because I want to save more time for comments and questions, etc. Let me use this time actually to reflect on the two presentations, which I think are are both very meaningful, very very interesting presentations. Um, first point that I would like to make, and, and here I think I would I would uh, express my solidarity with Professor Rosabi. I think the third neighbor policy is basically dead. It's been dying for a long time. It's been on life support for a long time. And that is just the reality of Mongolia's geopolitical position. In a world where things are going well, the third neighbor policy works well. In a world that is increasingly being polarized and where you have increasing confrontation between the United States and the West more broadly in China, it will become increasingly difficult for Mongolia to treat this ground, to walk the narrow line without falling over. And indeed, we have seen, and this is not just a consequence of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but a uh, uh, part of a process that really has developed even since the uh, time of President El Bigdorch, as far as I can see, uh, is that Mongolia is increasingly putting a lot more weight on its relationship with China and Russia in balancing between these two countries. And its third neighbor policy, as far as I can tell, is in uh, a, a respected third place, but really doesn't really have much of a role in terms of the strategic orientation of the country. Is that something surprising? No, it's not, because this is the reality of Mongolia's situation. Professor Rosabi just uh, outlined why the actual statistics, uh, Mongolia's reliance on China, for uh, uh, for exports, obviously, Mongolia's reliance on Russia, uh, and the reality that the West, as much as it likes to talk about uh, uh, how Mongolia is very important, is not really committed all that much to Mongolia, frankly, sees it as it's a, it's a slightly exotic country somewhere sandwiched between China and Russia, that, yeah, it's great that it's democratic, but fundamentally, it doesn't really matter for the United States, for example. And, and, and we have seen 
uh, a lukewarm uh, approach on the part of the United States to the question of Mongolia. Sadly so, sadly so. I say I wish the United States actually tried to do, uh, uh, try to to be more forthcoming uh, on 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 questions of economic cooperation with Mongolia, for example. So yeah, the third neighbor policy is not doing particularly well. I was struck by what uh, Ambassador Badbayev uh, said about uh, Mongolia's. Uh, uh, unofficial, shall we say, position on the war uh, that Russia is waging in Ukraine. Of course, officially, we know that Mongolia, constrained by its very real constraints, sorry to to uh, uh, to, to 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 use an oxymoron here, but um, uh, Mongolia simply has to be neutral and uh, you know cannot condemn Russia, etc. Uh, it's just uh, it has to it has to walk uh, uh, a tightrope here. But it, it's very interesting, and nonetheless, that what uh, Ambassador Badbayer said about uh, unofficial views in the Mongolian society with regard to uh, this notion that if Russia fails, then who does then Mongolia rely on? Um, I would contradict, uh, I think, Professor Rasabi here in the sense that I don't see any much scope here for Mongolia reorienting it, uh, itself towards China for obviously all the reasons that we know in psychological terms. Obviously, economically, it's very much there. And China exercises so much leverage over Mongolia, it's just not willing to use it. It's got so much leverage, it's not willing to use it. But Mongolians themselves, I think, are keeping China at a distance uh, in you know in psychological terms and still or orient themselves more towards Russia, which they don't see as a threat. You know, it's understandable why Russia may be seen as a threat by Ukraine, by the Baltic states. They see Russia as this vicious imperialist country that is going to, uh, if it's allowed to get away with what it's doing in Ukraine, it will next go to Baltics. You know, it will conquer all of Europe. And we may think that's that's fantasy. But a lot of people in Eastern Europe actually think, hey, historically, this is not a fantasy. We have to be worried about it. Uh, but the Mongolians are not so worried about it. I mean, if you look at the period of the Cold War... It is actually very interesting if you go back to the 1940s, and, and Ambassador Balbayar is a historian, fellow historian, also knows very well about this. Uh, there, you know, the, uh, people like Tsidenbal, for example, were actually favored, at that time favored Mongolia joining the Soviet Union because they thought that this was good for Mongolia to become a Soviet Republic. And bizarrely, it was actually the Soviets who said, no, we don't want you. We, we think that's a bad idea. And they pushed back against this idea back starting from Stalin, really, even after Stalin's death, this was the case. So with that, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting to see um, the continuation of that uh, idea in the Mongolian society that Russia's demise would be bad news for Mongolia. Is that a real thing? Probably, because if Russia really fell apart, which a lot of people in the West, some people, not a lot of people, but some people in the West are also kind of hopeful of, oh, let's decolonize Russia, see what happens. Uh, if, let's say, Russia did fall apart and that geopolitical space became vacuum, which China then could then extend its influence over, I think from the perspective of geopolitics, and Mongolian specialists in IR, of course, are all very skilled in geopolitics. That's the, you know, the, <laughs> that's what that's what they like to talk about. This is really bad news for Mongolia. So I can see that at unofficial level, even creeping into the corridors of power and in, in the foreign ministers, in the foreign ministry, in the conversations that we don't hear about, I think this they, this idea that Russia's defeat and uh, potentially Russian collapse would be bad for Mongolia. I can see how this could be a very valid idea. And of course, this other thing that Ambassador Badbayer that you mentioned about, um, about uh, Mongolians uh, thinking that, well, it's not just, it's, uh, it's not just Russia's fault and et cetera. In this, I think Mongolia's discourse very much parallels a broader discourse in the global south on the Russia-Ukraine war, because whereas in Europe, we think in Europe, oh my God, the Russians are invading, they're obviously doing horrible things, look at their atrocities and their genocidal policies in Ukraine. For a lot of people in the global south, A, they're worried about other problems, they're thinking, oh my God, climate change, we're not worried about Ukraine, we're worried about whether we'll have a drought next year and people will die, as uh, Professor Rasabi you know, has wisely pointed to that. Um, concern, they're, they're worried about poverty, their the development, and so on and so forth. And there's this other idea, and that is that, well, the West is also not without fault, i.e. the West has pursued, you know, the United States fought 
20 years of wars in, in the Middle East. And uh, uh, and then so what Russia is doing in Ukraine is maybe not so exceptional after all. So I can see where the sentiment is coming from. It is also interesting to know that Mongolia, of course, was very open to Russian uh, SKPs, as it were, uh, unlike, uh, for example, what, uh, Euro European countries that basically said, OK, let's ban all the Russians close to the borders and make sure no, nobody ever comes here um, from Russia. Uh, Mongolia actually opened up its borders and there was a considerable exodus of, of Russians, especially from Buryatia, you know, Buryats, etc. I think fundamentally it's probably good news for Mongolia because they bring, uh, in many cases, their expertise, they bring money, etc. So that is good. And, and that also showed Mongolia from kind of positive side as far as the Russians are concerned. So finally, the last point uh, that I was going to, uh, to talk about is uh, Mongolia in search of opportunities. Uh, Mongolia's opportunities are constrained by its geopolitical, by geographic position uh, between China and Russia. And this has not changed with the war against Ukraine that Russia is waging, i.e. Mongolia is fundamentally interested in how it can profit for, from a, a closer in, improving relationship between China and Russia. When the relation with, between China and Russia was bad, which is something that uh, we know happened in the late 1950s, early 1960s, Mongolia sided with the Soviet Union for reasons that we're all aware of. Uh, and that was not particularly good for Mongolian economic development. Now, what we have today is Russian and Chinese relationship getting closer and closer, and Mongolia is seeking to profit from this somehow, whether it's through getting pipelines being built across Mongolian territory. That's one of the big you know, projects that's out there that we have not quite have not seen, I mean, the Chinese are, I think, dragging their feet on this. But if we do see this realized, this is going to be great news for Mongolia. It's just serving as a transit for many other things, whether it's electricity, you know, oil and gas and, and, and et cetera. So, so Mongolia sees itself profiting from this relationship, also from China's uh, uh, BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and uh, it sees itself as a as a fairly mm, insignificant player in the global scheme of things. It doesn't have to stick its neck out there and say, "Okay, you know, we condemn Russia on every you know every single day and so on and so forth." It is trying to survive in a very hostile geopolitical environment. Will it? You know, and I'll finish with this one concern that I do have as we have increasing tendencies so where it's not necessarily bipolarity, but really separation uh, between decoupling, et cetera, between China and, and the West, and uh, uh, potentially you know some kind of reemergence of almost the Cold War framework. One thing I, I am concerned about in this relation, in this, in this, in this regard, is the future of Mongolian democracy. Obviously, when you're locked in between two uh, giants. Uh, that are deeply hostile to the idea of democracy. It is a miracle that actually Mongolian democracy has even survived for 30 years. It is a miracle, I think, that it still exists. And uh, at the same time, I am worried about its prospects going forward, especially uh, especially if we uh, see this further drift uh, towards confrontation between you know the East and the West. And I will end with this and uh, uh, pass back to uh, Liz. Thank you, Sergey, for those those comments that really summed up a, a lot of the points that our previous two speakers made. So I see uh, we have a few questions in the chat in the Q and A. I would uh, invite uh, participants to post questions there, and I will get to the questions that are already posted. Uh, but first, I I want to make ask a couple of um, well, one kind of broader question uh, for Ambassador Latviar. Um, so you mentioned that um, un unlike uh, European countries, Mongolia doesn't depend on Russia for gas, but it does depend on Russia for oil. 90% of its oil comes from Russia. And now um, until the refinery is completed, uh, it, this oil is then sent to China for refining. So, so um, Mongolia is very much connected uh, for its uh, energy needs to, to its two neighbors. Uh, and I think Mongolia realizes that. Um, when I had the pleasure to attend the Ulaanbaatar dialogue uh, prior to COVID, I remember there was a, a, a session devoted to Northeast Asian energy integration. And um, so I wonder about, about 
uh, Mongolia's integration in the Northeast Asian region as an emerging priority rather than focusing on individual third neighbors, which as Sergei mentioned is difficult in, in this current uh, climate. Um, and it, it brings to mind uh, the example of Kazakhstan uh, to me, because I, I just spent some time in Kazakhstan and there, uh, Kazakhstan is also feeling very anxious about the Russian war in Ukraine because of its long border with Russia, for one thing, and um, looking to integration in Central Asia as a, as a way out of this predicament. So I wonder if um, two things, um, you think two things might be valuable to Mongolia to reduce the pressure it feels from, from Russia and China. And one is to accelerate a transition away from fossil fuels. This would be helpful to Mongolia's uh, need to address pollution, as Professor Rasabi mentioned. Um, it would provide uh, industries in Mongolia, as, there, as uh, Dr. Rachenko mentioned, and it would provide some impetus for um, integration in renewables with other Northeast Asian countries. So I wonder if if that is a is a an avenue to look more towards the region, the Northeast Asian region, rather than to focus on individual neighbors that might not be willing to provide a, a counter support. Uh, okay, can I answer some questions? Yes. Okay. Please. Okay. Yeah, you know that. Uh, uh, I listened very carefully to a uh, very wise uh, presentation by Professor Maurice Sarasabi. Of course, he mentioned uh, uh, some very important uh, things. Uh, first is corruption in Mongolia. Uh, of course, uh, there is uh, corruption in Mongolia and, uh, and it is uh, unequal wealth distribution in Mongolia. It's a very growing gap between rich and poor. What this is a very frustrating among ordinary people. And they went into Sukhobatra Square in December last year and protest, protested uh, against this corruption and unequal distribution of wealth. So, you know, Mongolia uh, exports a lot of minerals to abroad, also, especially to China, and uh, we generate uh, some money, but money goes to uh, state-owned enterprises. In some part of money disappears, and some people, especially craft politicians, uh, get very rich in a very short time. But this frustrates uh, a lot of Mongolian ordinary people. And uh, I think the spring this year will be very hard for government to tackle with this issue. Uh, but, but I must say that uh, both government and parliament acknowledges this uh, problem of corruption and unequal distribution of wealth. And uh, they trying to do uh, some uh, very important uh, steps to tackle with this issue, corruption issue. The second uh, uh, issue, of course, was raised by Professor Rosabi and uh, supported by uh, Professor Ratchenko. This uh, Mongolia's third neighbor policy is, is not working. But uh, I must say that I, am, uh, I have different uh, opinion. I think uh, that third neighbor policy is still working. And we have a functional democracy and we have elections every four years and uh, elected officials, elected government has a responsibility before electors for their actions and policies. And also uh, our third neighbors like Japan, India, US are doing uh, their, uh, what in their capacity to help Mongolia. Japan, uh, using Japan's loans, we uh, finished the construction of international airport of Chinggis Khan. So now if you lease come to Mongolia, you can fly to our brand new international airport of Chinggis Khan. Uh, 
And India is uh, offered 1 billion US dollar loan. And we are uh, now uh, uh, building a oil processing plant. Mm -hmm. So we hope that uh, next three years we can finish uh, this oil processing plant. It will reduce uh, the Mongolia dependence on Russian oil. Uh, we want to use our own oil, Mongolia's oil, and also import some oil from China, then process it in Mongolia. It can, we, then we can uh, sufficiently uh, uh, supply our oil demands in Mongolia. Uh, in United States is uh, very important strategic partner and also uh, very important uh, uh, economic partner. Uh, we already implemented the second uh, uh, project of Millennium Challenge Account. This is a big money, uh, I think 350 million US dollar money for uh, Ulaanbaatar City water uh, cleaning water processing plant. It will help uh, uh, Ulaanbaatar tackle the issue of water in the next uh, 30 years. So I must say that these are just a few examples what our individual third neighbor countries are doing. Of course, uh, the idea by Professor Vishnik that, that uh, uh, Mongolia's efforts to join Northeast Asia integration, it's, it's of course, I think, uh, very important in uh, this uh, this now we uh, uh, initiated the Ulaanbaatar dialogue for Northeast Asia uh, because of COVID we did uh, interrupt for two years but I hope that this year we we revive uh, UB dialogue for Northeast Asia and this example. I told that in my presentation that, that pre during the president visit to Japan, there was a, a, a st established special strategic partnership between Japan and Mongolia for peace and prosperity in Northeast Asia. So, and also Mongolia is uh, accepting with great understanding that reason by Japan for free in the open Indo-Pacific region. And you know that South Korea uh, just uh, uh, declared its uh, uh, program for uh, free and open Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and uh, South Korea and Mongolia in, in talks how to together to move towards this uh, free and open Indo-Pacific region. So, uh, I think that uh, Mongolia is uh, active in, in uh, Northeast Asia region and is a responsible democratic country. Mongolia is accepted by most countries in Northeast Asia as is, uh, is active uh, uh, and a viable uh, partner in Northeast Asia. Uh, I received two questions uh, from audience. One was on pipeline on gas pipeline uh, from Russia through Mongolian territory to China. Uh, what is the current status of this pipeline? So I must tell that uh, uh, this pipeline issue was a long, long, uh, long time discussed between three countries. You know, uh, uh, when I was at Ministry of Foreign Affairs, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, this issue uh, was discussed and now it's, it's still discussed. But of course, we uh, last uh, two, three years, we see some change of attitude from Russia. Uh, President Putin, when he met our uh, prime minister in Vladivostok uh, September last year, uh, he, he told that uh, he will uh, support this uh, gas pipeline project and he will give, uh, give some uh, directions to its uh, uh, company, Gazprom, and other people. Uh, China was uh, not very much active. 
China was reluctant about this uh, gas pipeline issue. But uh, uh, I think in Samarkand last year, in, uh, uh, in sidelines of uh, SCO meeting, when there was trilateral meeting between Mongolia's pre President Hurusuk and uh, Russian President Putin and Chinese um, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping, there was, I, I think there was some talk about this pipe, gas pipeline. And uh, when President Hurusuk went to uh, Beijing, uh, uh, the first foreign visitor after COVID to China, in uh, it's the end of November, I think there was a statement. And the one article of the statement was about gas pipeline. And uh, uh, some Mongolian, my friends, telling me that uh, China is now officially supported this gas pipeline. So there is significant change on, on, uh, on China's uh, position on that issue. But of course, uh, it's just now uh, written statements. Uh, actual work is not yet begun. It has to begin. Yeah? So we, we cannot see real tangible results. It is only words and uh, written statements. Uh, can I bring in Professor Rosavi on this question before we get back to, to the other questions? Yeah, please, please, yeah. Oh, yeah, is please. there something you'd like to add about the pipeline? Well, no, no, uh, please, please go. We can go to Professor Rosavi, yeah. Yeah, uh, the, uh, it, of course, as I mentioned, it's been uh, discussed for decades. Uh, I remember discussing it with uh, the Minister of, of the Treasury in, in the 1990s. Remember Babar? when he was uh, Minister of Finance uh, in the 1990s, he was uh, talking about the, the, the pipeline even then. Uh, it hasn't eventuated, but uh, it seemed in the past year or, or two that things were moving in that direction. I don't know if it'll, I don't know if it'll uh, actually lead to a, an agreement, but uh, there, there is some movement in that regard. That's what I was trying to point out. Yeah. I. I wonder if China is is really supportive sure. of this pipeline because they're also negotiating with Turkmenistan for an additional gas pipeline um, from Turkmenistan to China, and there are questions about whether it will really need the gas um, that that this will involve. And also, China traditionally has had reservations about transit pipelines, um, so uh, perhaps unofficially they have supported it. I, I, I haven't seen them officially say that they're they're supporting the pipeline. I don't know. Um, Sergey, do you have something you'd like to add on the pipeline issue? Or? Well, you know, I, I I was always skeptical about the pipeline issue. Um, yeah. Historically, uh, obviously, it goes back. Uh, 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 already decades, as, as the panelists have, have, have pointed out. And the reason that I was skeptical about it was I could not understand why the Russians would go for it, given that they had so many problems with their pipeline across Ukraine uh, at that time. You know, when you transit through a, a country, you're basically, it becomes difficult for you to negotiate with this country and you are then, you know, you become hostage potentially to policies that this country pursues, or, you know, you can basically end up in a back blackmail situation. Russia doesn't need to do that because it has a way of exporting gas or oil, whatever it wants to directly, as of course it has been doing with the power of Siberia. So when this, when suddenly it was announced that there was move, I thought, oh, wow, I was so wrong about this. Uh, I clearly underestimated um, uh, the Russians in this regard and their interest in potentially, you know, I thought maybe this is the way that that Putin sees, you know, he would tie Mongolia to Russia. Uh, I mean, Putin has been relinquishing Russia's economic interests in Mongolia in moves that at the time I found also quite kind of difficult to understand, for example, giving up the internet, um, 
uh, 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 copper plant and, uh, 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 you know, doing things along the earth. So I thought, well, maybe this is some kind of a, uh, in, intelligent economic move uh, to show that Russia still has economic um, interest in Mongolia and uh, assert its influence in this way. Uh, we have had overflights uh, or in, you know, in Russian helicopters or to, to look to investigate the potential uh, potential route that this pipeline might take. But what we have seen since then is that the Chinese have been dragging their feet for all the reasons that you know people have just mentioned. Um, and I'm not seeing, you know, I will I will believe it when I see it. Um, and I'm a historian, so I'm really bad about predicting, you know, really bad predicting the future. But, you know, if the pipeline is actually built, I will say, oh, my God, I was so wrong. And they totally miss, uh, uh, you know, underestimated uh, uh, China's and Russia's interest in it. I see that Mongolia has great interest in it. If I were in Mongolia's shoes, I would also say, come on, guys, build this pipeline. We want it. But we're still to see practical steps of real nature, not just flying over Mongolian helicopters and say, yeah, well, you know, there's going to be pipeline through here. The Chinese pay for it and the Chinese are not paying for it. Yeah, I guess we'll see what happens if she visits uh, Putin in Moscow sometime in the near future. Because if you remember, the power of uh, Siberia pipeline deal was signed right after the first Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014. Um, so the, the next question is about Ukraine uh, and the impact of the Russian war in Ukraine on Mongolian democracy. Um, that one's for you, Ambassador Batayar. Yeah, uh, thank you for question. You, you know that, uh, as I told that uh, official position is very clear that Mongolia is peace-loving, open, multipolar uh, foreign policy, and we want to resolve uh, any such conflict uh, uh, by dialogue, by political and uh, diplomatic methods. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, public opinion in Mongolia is very polarized. I must tell that uh, the uh, leading members of Democratic Party is very, very critical uh, of Putin, anti-Putin, as a her position. And, uh, uh, they, uh, they proposed to, uh, to visit Kyiv, uh, I mean, uh, the leaders of uh, Mongolian Democratic Party who proposed a, they will go to Kyiv to visit uh, Ukraine to show their solidarity. And uh, also they would like to uh, invite President Zelensky to make a video presentation on Mongolian parliament. But it's, uh, uh, of course, it's, uh, position of minority uh, members of parliament uh, elected by uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, but you know, Mongolian government is, is uh, trying to stay as neutral as possible because of uh, 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 constraints of, uh, as you mentioned, that some economic factors like uh, almost 100% of oil imports were dep dependent on Russia. Uh, and also the government is uh, somehow trying to uh, advance the uh, economic projects like uh, three country economic corridor, uh, Russia, China, Mongolia economic corridor. So it means that uh, they want to uh, modernize uh, railway connect them, uh, Russia and China uh, through Mongolia and uh, to build the uh, automobile highway uh, between uh, Russia and Ch China through Mongolia. So uh, this kind of uh, projects of trilateral economic cooperation. But uh, as I said in my uh, end of my presentation that I'm, uh, I'm not very much enthusiastic about this kind of things seeking short-term economic gains uh, from Moscow and Beijing using this uh, Russia's uh, war uh, in Europe. So I, I personally think that we should uh, stay neutral as possible and uh, not to make any 
uh, strong advances uh, into trilateral economic cooperation uh, at, at this time uh, when the war is, uh, is going on with intensity in Europe. So uh, uh, my personal opinion is that we should stick into our long-term commitment to liberal democracy and to our third neighbors and to our uh, democracy. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in my uh, presentations with my colleagues, I uh, always ask them to think of twice uh, before making any uh, uh, policy statements or policy steps that during the, uh, this crisis time, uh, there are two neighbors. We must be very cautious. Uh, following on that topic, we have a question about the surge in Mongolia's exports in 2022 compared to 2021. Uh, the questioner says a 36% increase and asks if Mongolia is serving as a gateway for Russian trade that seeks to evade uh, Western sanctions. Uh, I think it's uh, not the case. It's just because uh, during COVID time, you know, we could not export our minerals to China. You know, um, our main uh, export to minerals uh, to China are coal, uh, copper, and gold. And, uh, but uh, last year in 2022, especially the second half of 2022, our exports to uh, China, our minerals were resumed. And uh, of course it did, did not reach the, the, the volume of uh, minerals export in 2019 before COVID, but I think it uh, increased by maybe 30% in some statistics show. So it is not the case that we uh, uh, doing some transit between uh, Russia and China trade, but it's rather Mongolian minerals export to China was increased. Uh, thank you. Um, and so, what about the impact of the China model on Mongolia? Uh, a questioner asks, what is the relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and the Mongolian People's Party? And this is for anyone on the panel. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, I must tell that China is uh, doing their best efforts to, uh, to change Mongolians' uh, attitude toward China, you know, is uh, Professor Ratchinka mentioned, we have this historical uh, burden. Uh, I, I think that uh, we don't like uh, big uh, southern neighbor. We are afraid that southern neighbor can uh, integrate us or absorb us economically uh, by peaceful means uh, slowly. So this fear is still, uh, 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 most Mongolians still have, uh, uh, has this fear of southern neighbor of China. So China is doing uh, uh, some efforts to change this attitude of Mongolians, negative attitude of Mongolians to China. They invite uh, a lot of media people from Mongolia to China and shows uh, how China changed, how is uh, China becoming rich and uh, how is China also uh, treating its uh, small neighbors like Laos, Cambodia, I mean, in, in uh, Southeast Asia and trying to show that uh, nothing to afraid of uh, China. So this uh, somehow works, you know, and I think uh, if you, 30 years ago, it was overwhelming anti-China sentiment in Mongolia. So I think uh, now it's changed. And uh, of course, there is still a fear of Chinese enormous size and uh, 1 billion people. Uh, but uh, I think uh, things are changing in the favor of uh, Chinese uh, uh, 
policy. Uh, concerning the, uh, the inter-party relations, uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party is, uh, uh, when I was working in Beijing in our embassy, they uh, worked closely with uh, People's Party of Mongolia and Democratic Party of Mongolia, both parties. Uh, and the uh, Chinese Communist Party thinks that Mongolia has a multi-party system. It has to deal with this reality. And they try to cultivate uh, good uh, working relations with both parties, People's Party and Democratic Party. I think the uh, Chinese Communist Party is still continues this practice now. There is a... Uh... You know, uh, uh, Dr. Rachenko mentioned uh, the uh, xenophobia, uh, which st I think still somewhat exists. Uh, I, I, I didn't mean to uh, point out that, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Chinese and, and the Mongols are free of tension and they should get uh, work together on climate and, and so on and uh, pollution issues. Uh, those are the kinds of issues that that uh, I think they could cooperate on, but there are uh, tensions that still exist between uh, China and and uh, and Mongolia. Uh, for example, the issue of language in Inner Mongolia. A few years ago, the uh, Chinese decreed that most of the schools that used to have uh, Mongolian taught for, for much of the day. Now, uh, some of the uh, schools would be, some of the classes would be taught in Chinese rather than in, in Mongolian. There was some protest, minimum, I don't think a tremendous amount of protest, but there was some protest in, in Mongolia. Some uh, were, were quite concerned about that change. And there's also the question of the Dalai Lama. Uh, the Dalai Lama's visits to Mongolia were uh, uh, condemned repeatedly by uh, by the Chinese. So there still are issues. I agree with uh, Dr. Rachenko on that score. Sergey, do you want to add something? Uh, I ju just just a couple of points. Uh, you know, it's 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 almost uh, banality to talk about uh, tension, social tension between China and, and Mongolia. Anybody who spent time in Mongolia, of course, would know about this at the social level. They're certainly there. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think in line with the other uh, speakers, I would just say that we should see uh, the limits to that, you, whether you call it phobia or, you know, anything, you know, you, there are, it may, maybe even words like that do not really suit the, uh, the, the, uh, the topic. And the limits are seen uh, very well in the policy that Mongolia itself pursues officially at the pragmatic level. One example of this is when President Batulak became president, former President Batulak, when he became, before he became president, it's well known that he had, oh, he was very, you know, he made all kinds of anti-Chinese pronouncements. And there were concerns that once he became president, that he would do something you know, outrageous with regard to China. But lo and behold, the moment he became president, he actually started to pursue fairly pragmatic policy towards the southern neighbor. So there is this understanding that regardless of historical the grievances or tensions at the social level, etc. Uh, China is there. It's not going away anywhere. And Mongolia has to engage with this. And that would say, by the way, that it's also uh, this this pragmatism uh, and, and the kind of almost a hands-off uh, attitude is also evident in China's case. I mean, China, given its enormous economic leverage over Mongolia, I mean, they could uh, really push their weight around in a major kind of way, but they don't. They don't, except when it comes, as Professor Rosabi just mentioned, when it comes to specific kind of narrow areas, like we remember with that Dalai Lama visit that, 
caused uh, China to kind of, you know, uh, basically impose economic sanctions overnight, which then were resigned when the Mongolian government said, oh, it's not going to happen again, it's not going to happen again. So there are these narrow areas, uh, and the Chinese are not pushing their luck. They're not saying, oh, you know, we have so much weight now that we can basically get the Mongolian government to do anything we want to. I think they're pragmatically understanding. They, they, uh, they, they understand that there's this uh resentment of china in some quarters of the mongolian society which can be actually used by populist politicians uh and they're i wouldn't say they're necessarily fine with this but they tolerate this and that also shows the pragmatic side of chinese approach and uh, as ambassador Badbair just said they have been working with both parties uh including even with uh, uh with president batulak who became you know after he became president again had a in Enjoyed actually fairly uh, fairly reasonable relationship with China. Uh, thank you. So I have a question about um, media narratives and how they shape uh, uh, opinion in Mongolia about uh, China and Russia. So this is a hot topic in Central Asia, where uh, you have a lot of Russian speakers, just as you have in Mongolia, and the influence of Russian state media is quite strong. And, and shapes opinion um, in these countries about uh, Russia, about the Russian war in Ukraine and so on. So I wonder what is the situation in Mongolia with respect to Russian language media and Russian state media? Um, does that impact how uh, people view Russia? And, and what about Chinese media? Do you have Mongolian language Chinese media trying to shape narratives about China as well? Okay, thank you for question. You know that uh, concern of media, of course, Mongolia is a very young country now. And the, the whole generation after 1990, say, I think in more, more Western leaning uh, young people, I mean that they prefer English. Uh, first foreign language is English. The young people even don't know Russian. So we, my generation, we uh, from 1950s, born 1950s, uh, we were Russian educated. We are Russian speakers and we listen to Russian uh, state propaganda. Yeah. Uh, but, but young people, they never listen. Uh, they have no knowledge of Russian language. So they never listen to Russian propaganda. So the uh, main source of information for them is social media. Of course, uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, and this kind of things. So, uh, uh, young people are not uh, influenced by Russian state propaganda. Uh, as concerning Chinese media, of course, uh, a lot of young people learn in Chinese language, and the Chinese government offering a uh, lot of government scholarships to Mongolian young people. And because of COVID, uh, they could not uh, study in China for the last three years, but I hope this year they will uh, continue the studies in China. And I think these uh, young people with Chinese uh, language, they uh, listen to Chinese uh, media, I think. But it is not majority, it's a small minority in Mongolian uh, population. And so, I think uh, the, the impact of uh, Russian and Chinese media on Mongolian population, especially young uh, segment of population is very small. Any final thoughts by the panelists? Uh, when we start with Dr. Rachenko, since you were last. I am, of course, muted. Um, it, it, it's been a pleasure. It, it's been a pleasure uh, speaking to you and, and, and discussing uh, Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia is often uh, um, overlooked uh, in the broader discussions about you know Russian Chinese relations, and it's too bad uh, because it does. Uh, uh, play a very specific, very important role in this relationship. And of course, there uh, it has done so historically going back 
uh, years and decades. So it's very good that we're having uh, this discussion. And it's a particular pleasure as well to have uh, Ambassador Bud Beyer here contributing his thoughts. Uh, I think his remarks were very interesting and provocative. And I would also like uh, to thank uh, Professor Rasabi for his uh, very insightful remarks. I think this sort of conversation should really continue uh, now, especially that the era of COVID it seems to be kind of over and Mongolia is once again open for business. So I, for my part, I'm really looking forward to going to Mongolia as I will uh, this coming summer and continuing these conversations uh, about Russia, about China, about how Mongolia sees itself um, in the in this uh, changing changing world order. The fact that it's changing, I think beyond doubt, uh, the outlines of what it will look like are still uncertain. Mongolia is facing tremendous challenges uh, on, uh, on you know, in terms of its foreign relations and in terms of its uh, uh, economic situation, as well as we know. Um, but those are conversations that are very much worth to be had. Thank you. Um, Professor Rosabi? Well, uh, I, I must say I, I, it's been a learning experience for me too, getting uh, uh, the thoughts of two very distinguished uh, specialists on Mongolia. You know, we don't often have an opportunity to discuss Mongolia these days uh, in, you know, in a in a group of, of uh, people who know something about it. And so it's a pleasure to have uh, been on this panel. I, I guess one of the things that's, that's most disappointing to me is uh, having been involved in bringing quite a few Mongolians through the Soros Foundation to study abroad and come here and become really top flight people that uh, in everything from public health to development economics, is that when they go back, they are not offered the jobs that, that really care, uh, really could do very, very well because of corruption and, uh, and nepotism. Um, I wish some of these people, and some of these people have subsequently left, they've come back to the States or gone to Canada or other places when we were really hoping that they could go back to Mongolia and play an important role. So um, I hope, as I say, this corruption uh, is dealt with. Uh, 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 Ambassador Batbayar is, is, seems confident that it will be, and I hope he's right. Thank you. Ambassador? Okay, okay so I would like to finish an optimistic note about <laughs> Mongolia. You know, that after just uh, COVID finished, uh, uh, last week I visited Tokyo, Japan. So when I went to uh, the a brand new Chinggis Khan airport. I can see the flights to to Japan uh, five times a week to Korea every day by two airlines, Mongolian and South Korean, and flights to Istanbul, Turkey uh, every day. So it means uh, Mongolia is uh, uh, Mongolia's uh, uh, the the uh, uh, communications are very diversified and. A lot of Mongols travel uh, to Europe uh, and to Japan and South Korea, and I think uh, it it uh, it uh, makes me optimistic about Mongolia's future. And on um, in uh, 2024, we will have a parliamentary elections, and I hope that these elections will be very crucial because uh, the uh, the ordinary people are very frustrated about corrupt politicians. And uh, uh, the uh, and the opposition parties uh, 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 try uh, very hard to change the constitu constitution and electoral law. That that the people with uh, young people with uh, strong voice can be elected to the parliament, not corrupt politicians. So I think uh, this is very good trend, and I hope that. Uh, we can do it because for last 30 years, uh, in spite of our minuses, and uh, we could uh, preserve our democracy. And I hope that we can do it in the future. And uh, my special thanks to uh, Professor Liz uh, Wishnik uh, uh, for caring about Mongolia and for people of Wesley Institute uh, 
uh, who uh, brilliantly organized this uh, uh, online panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Batpayar, for staying up late at night to, to share your great insights with us and to Professors Rasavi Ratenko and uh, the Weatherhead East Asian Institute, the Harriman Institute, and the program of China and the World. Mongolia is indeed a fascinating country, and I am also optimistic it will escape from its great power grid gridlock and uh, go on to an illustrious future. So thank you to all of you for sure. staying with us for this dialogue, and uh, we wish you a good morning or a good evening, uh, wherever you may be. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.